Hey guys, Joshua Peterson with Peterson Electric here today. Um, it's been a while since I've done a video, so I thought I'd update you on the arc faults of the panels. Um, I did, a, I think, a, a video about four and a half years ago before they adopted the 2014 code when I thought that some of the cities were going to start enforcing arc faults when you just change a panel in the same location. That was a part of the 2011 code where the arc fault protection had did not have an exception yet that if you didn't move the panel, you know, six foot or two foot or 20 feet, it, they still wanted you to arc fault. They had an exception in 2014 that you don't have to do that, but um, we pulled a permit on this panel. We always pull permits on our meters and our panels. The one thing that they made us do, and this is the Excel side for the power side of this jurisdiction in Denver. Um, they had an old IMC conduit coming up with an LB fitting that was going in the side of the old meter. Um, in the back side of that, uh, that fitting, it was arced and it was starting to melt the wire of the feeder. So they had to resplice their conductor longer inside and then we bent this Schedule 80 uh, 2 inch piece of PVC here and then put in our slip sleeve and then still choked our conduit within that 3 foot. And then this is a brand new bypass meter lever. So it was really tricky to get in there. We we had the customer help us out. They did a great job. They were spraying this fitting here with WD-40 for about a week. That way when we came to break it, it broke pretty easy. Um, but yeah, that was required to get that out of there. And now everything lands in here well. And then we came into here. So once you get into here, um, what I did is I came out. Uh, last week and I did all my bonding because it's winter time and we run out of daylight real quick We had to put in our two ground rods on the side of the house because this is all deck of course all the way across and cement over there So our ground rods are around the corner um, Our inner system bonding bridge bars here and then in a nutshell once we bonded everything in the panel and got the cabinet up um, We arc faulted this panel uh, for two reasons one uh, is something the customer desired to do and two the city hasn't enforced it quite yet for these arc faults but because I'm going to be doing a, a pigtail copper splicing with all of the devices inside according to article 40612 um, I have to now arc fault I think it's in 406.6 .6 now um, the house because I'm changing every single plug and doing our aluminum pigtail copper splicing which is very similar to this method where this wire was too short going into the panel um, so just so you know, if you land this aluminum and it's long enough to hit the breaker, um, a lot of guys are squirt deox underneath here or they'll pigtail copper splice everything when aluminum's in the panel. That is incorrect. If you read your breaker, it actually states that it's AL slash CU. That means it can adapt to both different precious metals and you don't have to do that. Um, here's another thing real quick about arc faults I wanted to show you. Um, this is interesting. This is actually a... Um, this is a dual action breaker, so it GFCIs and arc faults. So in a situation of a kitchen in the 2014 code, your counter outlets have to meet the 210.8 rule on uh, GFCI, but it also has to meet arc fault in 210.12 now. And so here's something I want to show you. This is kind of an interesting trick of the trade. Um, you can actually wire this outlet, or excuse me, this breaker, the device in reverse and I had this happen earlier this year and I couldn't figure out what happened this breaker is smart enough to detect an arc fault but it's not smart enough to detect reverse polarity at the breaker so when I went to turn it on I noticed that I had the uh, the grounded conductor the white one the neutral on the top side over here well it's supposed to reverse once you turn the breaker 180 degrees it goes to the bottom and here's how I test my arc faults. I'll come in here and I'll just say, okay, we look good, light bulb on, light bulb on, and so on. Well, as soon as I hook myself up to a different potential, I can trip my dual action or my AFCIs. And I actually prefer to do that because I don't really trust these test buttons. I want to fault it to make it seem like there's a fault because I'm using an alternate path of current after the light bulb. Now, a normal breaker will never do that. It'll just stay on. So once I do that, I'll reset. And you can test. Now you can sure hit your own test button. 
but if you're trying to really fault it, this is the generic side the customer can do because the dead front cover's on and they can't get in here and hurt themselves. They can just hit that button and know if they're well. Um, common life I've seen on uh, older arc fault, first generation was about 10 to 12 years on the outside of a home. Inside they lasted longer because of the temperature. Um, on these, I'm assuming I'll probably get anywhere from 12 to 15. Um, assuming of number one that snow isn't getting in here and we'll have, this is a R3 rated lip type panel so we shouldn't have any issue there. Um, now here's here's what's interesting is I came in here on this arc fault and I went to test it and I couldn't trip it. I tripped it on the neutral. So that tells me that I can reverse polarity all of those outlets and lights and switches and, and the lights in the house and not have an issue, or and, and I will not have an issue here, but when my inspector goes to plug test, what he's gonna look for is taking a very generic tester that most people can get at Homes and Lowe's, or Home Depot or Lowe's, and this just generically tells you, hey, are we faulted? Now, if I get on this older tester two orange lights, that means I do not have a reverse polarity. And now when you go and plug in your house, if you have a 1950s homes to 40, 30, 20s, or in the early part of the 1800, or late part of 1800, you will have a two-prong outlet. You can't test ground. There is no common wire to take you all the way back to the panel to test that. So these three-prong plugs are only good for the purpose of checking for reverse polarity, or if you've dropped a neutral or a hot or a ground. Now originating from this panel if I plug this circuit in which I believe this circuit 12 is in here on the dining lights or somewhere in the living room or the hallway I'll go upstairs and I would plug this into an outlet and it would show on here that I actually have a hot neutral reverse and it would show red yellow not yellow yellow so real simple again it was a, something I caught that I did in a small condo I actually had to arc fault the whole entire panel because it was in a small apartment. It was this January in the city of Loveland I did that and we had an inspection. Um, but I caught it because I started getting reverse polarity in all of my neutrals on certain circuits. And I realized it was the right side of the panel that I had done that mistake. So I just want to share with you that, yeah, this is the other reason why I used my light bulb to test it, is I come in here and I want to make sure... See, now the neutral, of course, won't do anything, but the hot, boom, I can trip it. So again, on the side of the breaker, it should show you load power, okay, how long to strip it, and this should also show you neutral load, okay. Again, this, this video is for electricians and uh, professionals who have licenses all over the country. I hope this video will help you out. If you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer your question. If you're a homeowner who calls me up from Virginia or even Colorado where I live, don't call me and ask me questions on this. I'm not gonna answer your questions. I'm gonna tell you to call a professional. We do videos to help um, the customer, educate them. It is an infomercial at times, but it's here to show you. For an example, this house was 1973. I don't even think I was born yet, about two years off. Um, this this uh, was all designed with aluminum inside the home and old original meter and an FPE Federal Pacific Electric panel which you could google that and you'll find all kinds of stuff on YouTube from me and other guys about it um, but we changed and upgraded this to make it safe um, again we had to meet our, meet our breaker requirement in 240 no switch can be higher than six foot seven inches for so for me it's always about right here I was two inches shy and that was interesting because the wire stubbed out really high in center point. So I had to cut the siding down and move it and scoot it over. And then I used my hydraulic knockout set for you guys that know what that is. And then I enlarged from a two inch to a two and a half inch um, PVC MA adapter in the back so I could get all these wires in. Because the lumen are a little bit fatter by their insulation type and just by their conductor size. Um, once I got all that in, I just went ahead and knocked out this as a two inch myself uh, and raised that panel up here. That's also in the code. We did use bond bushings on both sides. Um, I have found that in article 250 and an inspector and I talked about it. He felt anything at 277 to 480 volts needed only that. 
but I showed them an article where it actually shows it didn't say voltage. It actually just says if you use it, have it eccentric or concentric. So this right here is going to be your concentric knockout by manufacturer on the beginning side of your feeder, which has no breaker. Okay, your fuse does not count in the transformer. Um, right here at the beginning side, you have to bond both sides of these cabinets because now we took away the IMC conduit, we are now PVC. We are an insulated item. So there's just no bond. There's no ground whatsoever on this cabinet. If I had put a PVC here and a PVC there, and then the hot wire ended up floating or cutting and touching this panel here, this, uh, this meter would have been energized. And anybody that would have touched it or painted it, it would have knocked them on the ground. So the feeder wire I wanted to show you real quick. Um, did you clean that up, Alicia? Yeah. Ah, uh, kick that out. Where'd you put it? Yes, you did. Okay. No. Yes, okay. So right here, I had just a teeny little hole in the insulation. And I looked in there, and just when the sun hit it perfect, I could tell, and this was the middle of the wire. So this was coming in on an ugly LB right here. And this was bending right here, and then bending back up to get into the top of the old meter can. And when I pulled out that IMC conduit, I, I called Excel back and said, hey, guys, get over here in a scurry because I had a little hole that was already starting. And he said, hey, if it's just Nick, let's put a heat shrink and heat it up with a, a torch and we would be good and put some uh, 3M uh, 88, I think it's 88 3M uh, tape because it has that extra super duty. But we could have heat, heat shrunk that and put it all together just fine. But he said, hey, I need to get back over. And so he went ahead and just re-spliced it for me. But that right there, these guys were probably six months to a year off from that melting down. Because when aluminum breaks like that, it just starts to continue. And again, that LB might have been a little bit hot uh, because um, that was starting to energize the LB and we had no ground. Now, we did have a, a bushing here, an offset nipple, so it might have grabbed that, but it might have not. So. Um, anyways guys I just wanted I wanted to show you this this is great we actually installed all of these without having to trace in the house but we did come that was the last point we did come the night before or, or last week and we actually labeled her and I with a phone every single circuit and once we labeled it we also put um, a sticker around it so I knew where 15 and 14 was and then when I did that I went through this whole entire panel and I had extra breakers, I always buy extra, but I went, okay, okay, we found that circuit 20 was gonna be our kitchen southeast counter. Well, we automatically have to have a, a 20 amp breaker, of course, and it has to be FCI, GFCI, according to 210, 12, and 210.8. So we went ahead and labeled that 20. I set that aside, came in here, we needed a dual, again, a 20 amp dual function. Why? Because that was down in the lower living room. Which the living room, interesting enough, on newer homes have copper 15 amp circuit at 14 gauge wire. This house was designed with a living room at a 20 amp circuit, 12 gauge um, aluminum. So the reason why we dueled it is because we had a bunch of outlets that came from the living room into the garage and off the back porch. So instead of me going in the garage and GFCI in every single plug, I went ahead and put a dual action here so I don't have to GFCI anything when I come in and do my pigtail copper splicing. Plus it makes it easier to get all that in the box without the old pigtails. But here's one, here's a fridge. The fridge is not closer than six foot so we don't have to worry about that. It's across the kitchen. But it does have to be AFCI'd. And then we just did a 15 amp on that because the code doesn't say it has to have 20. So we put circuit 18. So again, we, we pulled those wires out, wrapped it, labeled it. Now we'll take these green and red tapes off. The red was the arc fault, the green were the dual action. And now we'll transfer that to our panel cover right here that we've already knocked out. And now I'll transfer all that information onto here. Then I'll take off circuit 15, which of course is not 15. It's gonna be one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15. And then I'll relabel this 14 as 15, and then just throw away the 14 sticker. But I was, again, their panel cover, dead front, had nothing labeled. Now, if it did have something labeled, 
I probably would have checked that and then I would have said, oh, okay, this is circuit six. And I would have transferred that to six with a sticker and then I could have wrote it on a notepad and then when I come back to install, my six usually won't rub off real well. But I do put these this tape on. It's really hard to get off after a few days, but I'll be able to come in here now, just pull this guy off and label it the main bath and main exercise room. And that way I'll relabel that as uh, circuit one. Um, that way, if somebody decides to move a breaker, that one will stay there. Now, if you have to erase on your dead front cover, just use some fingernail polish. It'll work really well for old um, Sharpie writing on it. And I carry some fingernail polish in the truck with an old rag and I wipe that off. Um, anyway, guys, I've taken way too much time in this video, but I hope that helps you out. Again, this, this is actually at the end of 2014. I'm changing in one week to our new code in 2017. It'll come out. It'll be adopted by May. So we don't know yet if the city's going to start requesting all of these art fault breakers. I've heard that they might. I know that Westminster is in Colorado. Um, if your jurisdiction is doing it, feel free to send me an email on that YouTube. I'd love to know what cities and counties are enforcing that. Um, other than that, in my opinion, start practicing it. If you are changing all your plugs and switches afterwards uh, to update copper or verse aluminum, you should do that. That's what code states you're supposed to do. Um, and if you start tripping, hopefully there'll be some other videos to help you trace that inside the house. But thanks again, guys. We'll see you next week.